Today I'm going to talk a little about cases of metrical incoherence, see these really interesting cases where you have conflicted metrical systems in which different prosodic properties diagnose different types of um, foot structure or um, in general metrical structure. Um, so I'm going to try to uh, see if we can extend an analysis of, of um, these top-down prominent systems in which there's a pitch accent system that overrides a word level stress. I'm going to see if that type of analysis can be extended to other more um, complicated cases where you have um, segmental diagnostics for metrical structure disagreeing with um, di the diagnosis of metrical structure strictly from stress. And I'll look, um, I'll present some phonetic data from two languages, uh, one that I've worked on uh, for a while, Chickasaw, Muscogean language, and another Uralic language, Nganasan, that I've not worked on long, uh, so the data will be more preliminary. Um, but I'm going to see if these types of systems, which are different from each other, um, superficially have um, a deeper uh, commonality. Okay, and then I'll explore how the data from these two languages tie into the larger issue of whether you might want to adopt a grid-based or a foot-based uh, analysis of stress. Okay, so first I'll talk a little about, I'll give an overview of word level versus phrase level prominence, and then I'll talk about the typology of metrical incoherence. It's, it's a relatively small typology, but it seems to be growing uh, and how it's been treated in the, in the theory. And then I'll look at two case studies, as I said, one that's um, more amenable to a single metrical analysis, so analysis employing a single type of metrical structure. Um, that's the case of top-down prominence in Chickasaw. And then I'll talk about another type of metrical incoherence uh, involving a conflict between stress and segmental uh, alternations that appear, that fall out easily from an analysis that appeals to the foot. Um, but the segmental diagnostic, diagnostics disagree with the foot structure that you'd, or uh, metrical structure you'd want to posit based on the stress data alone. Okay, uh, and then I'll uh, uh, explore um, what type of analysis can unify these two types of metrical incoherence, one involving top-down prominence and the other involving a mismatch between segmental uh, diagnostics and um, stress. Okay, so there's been a long-standing debate about whether foot-based theories or grid-based analyses of stress are, um, offer better empirical coverage. Um, I actually am leaning toward foot-based approaches as offering better coverage um, in light of a lot of recent data um, that suggests that there are um, groupings, and we'll hear uh, more evidence for that uh, later today. Okay, so. First, let's talk about word level and phrase level prominence. Uh, in most languages, metrical structure is bottom-up, built in bottom-up fashion, where you start with segments and construct feet, and then you construct a layer of word level prominence from the feet, uh, and then you tie together words into phrases, and there can be larger phrases and smaller phrases, uh, and then there are um, conventions for assigning relative prominence within these larger domains. So if you have something like alligator swim, you might have, by default, uh, the strongest uh, prominence, the phrasal prominence on the second word. Uh, and then once you have the, the metrical structure in place, uh, then there's all these segmental diagnostics where the strength of the diagnostics and the type of diagnostics vary from language to language, but typically they converge on the same metrical analysis. So you can see that the segmental rules in English, there's pitch accent placement uh, that arrive at the same conclusions about what the parse looks like prosodically. Okay, um, what if you had a language in which alligators could swim? So this would be a top-down prominence system where you have the phrasal context a shift, triggering a shift in word level stress. So English has um, some uh, inklings of this type of top-down prominence, where if you put English words in a certain phrasal context, you might get a secondary stress syllable being bumped up to uh, primary stress, so a case like 13 becoming 13 men, uh, where you have a swapping of the secondary and primary stress uh, due to the phrasal context. Uh, uh, you get languages 
Uh, other languages that display this kind of property where depending on the phrasal context, you get a shift in the stress pattern. For example, in Cayuga, you have final prominence phrase internally, uh, and then you have pre-final prominence phrase finally. Uh, in a lot of these languages, it's not exactly clear what the prominence is or what the domains are, but the general pattern seems to um, be found in several languages where you have these asymmetries depending on phrasal position. Uh, Tiberian Hebrew is a very interesting case where you uh, appear to have different foot structure uh, depending on whether the word is prepausal or not. Um, and it, this is a particularly striking case because you have vowels that disappear in one phrasal context that are lengthened in another phrasal context. Okay, so there are some commonalities shared by these top-down prominence systems, it seems. Though there aren't many, we can uh, start to see some similarities emerge. One is that there's a distinction between phrase final versus phrase internal position. Phrase finally, there is some tendency for a prominence to be oriented toward the right edge, but at the same time yeah, as being oriented toward the right edge, it's not exactly at the right edge. There's some tendency for repulsion from the right edge, so you get something that's pre-final in terms of prominence. Um, in these top-down prominence systems, the ones that are called, I am calling top-down prominence system, they're not so problematic for the theory because the segmental correlates of metrical structure shift along with prominence. So things that might be in weak position phrase internally, if they wind up in a prominent position phrase finally, then they'll lengthen. Okay. So that's different from the more problematic the Nganasan type conflicts that we'll talk about. So in these systems, we can say that word level and phrase level metrical structure conflicts, but the segmental diagnostics of metrical structure uh, and the metrical systems are coherent. So once we have the metrical system as diagnosed by prominence in place, then the segmental diagnostics follow from that. More problematic are these conflicted metrical systems where you have segmental properties that um, are explainable in terms of foot structure, uh, but that foot structure doesn't accord with the kind of foot structure you'd assume if you just looked at stress patterns. So, uh, so this has, uh, these kind of conflicts have uh, invoked or um, inspired uh, analyses that employ both grid marks and feet. Uh, we'll talk about one case here. So um, Olga Weisman, in a really interesting dissertation, talks about a number of cases from Uralic languages where you have mismatches, these metrical conflicts. Here's one of them we'll talk about today. So in Ghanasan, the stress pattern places stress on the final long vowel, otherwise on the penultimate syllable, assuming it contains a full vowel, i.e. a non-central vowel. Otherwise, stress falls on the antipenalty if the penalty is short and the final vowel is not a long vowel. And there are some complications uh, involving the last clause in the stress system that we'll come back to in a second. Uh, now, the segmental diagnostic, diagnostic that doesn't match the stress pattern or the foot structure you'd posit based on looking at the stress pattern alone fall, um, is constant gradation, where constant gradation might be more familiar from uh, uh, Finnic languages. Uh, to many people, um, but there's something roughly similar that happens in Ghanasan where you have the strong grade of a consonant occurring in the onset of even-numbered syllables, where you have the weak grade occurring in the onset of odd-numbered syllables. Uh, long vowels interrupt the alternating syllable count, suggesting that they have a, a privilege metrically, they're privileged metrically, as long as they're not uh, word initial. Uh, so long vowels are always preceded by weak consonants. So there's various types of changes involved in gradation. Um, some of them are more transparent than others. They're listed here. Uh, tried to roughly group them into three categories that are relatively coherent internally. Uh, but there's really a motley set of alternations involved. Okay, here's uh, one suffix that illustrates this alternation, uh, tu and du, where you have the strong grade uh, in the top uh, two forms where you have it's in the onset of an even-numbered syllable, then you have the weak grade uh, in the onset of an odd-numbered syllable. Uh, the crucial thing about this is that uh, this, these data is that gradation does not fall out easily uh, from a description that appeals only to stress because you can get either the weak or the strong grade in post-tonic position, as you see from these data. <clears throat> 
Okay. Now, uh, as Weizmann shows, the gradation pattern does follow nicely if you assume a left to right trochaic parse in which long vowels form their own foot, then you can say that the weak grade occurs at the left edge of a foot. Uh, so you can see that the two thu, you have the weak grade in the last two forms because it's in the left edge of a foot. Uh, the strong grade occurs foot internally. It's a little bit counterintuitively. You might think a foot internal position as being associated with weakening and foot initial with strengthening, um, but uh, that's the way it is. Uh, okay. <laughs> I guess, uh, as we saw earlier, these things can be learned, even if they don't make sense um, so, so much phonetically. Okay, and the same thing going in the second form, strong grade, uh, foot internally, weak grade, foot initially. Okay, um, now one question that we come back to, uh, the feet don't get us the gradation, or the feet get us a gradation um, pattern, but they're not the same feet that we'd... Uh, assume exists based on looking at the stress pattern alone, but are these metrical feet diagnosed through gradation completely irrelevant for stress? And the answer is no. There is some intersection between these two systems. One involves secondary stress. So secondary stress is positioned according to the same left to right trochaic parts that we get from gradation, okay? But not if a secondary stress would clash with the primary stress. So in that case, the secondary stress is suppressed. Okay, so the metrical conflict actually in, is between primary stress and gradation, not stress as a whole, not secondary stress. Okay, and this will be an important point uh, that we'll come back to. Uh, another case in which the trochaic parse is relevant is in determining stress if you have the penalty and the antipenalty both occurring with the same central vowel, which are metrically weak. Um, so that's the, um, this is the addendum to the third clause in the stress pattern that we saw earlier. Um, in that case, you put stress on the strong syllable according to the trochaic parse. Okay, and then there's another complication where there's a distinction of weight between a super light a high central vowel and a, a more uh, and a heavier central vowel uh, where then that can override the trochaic parse. Okay, so anyway, so the theory that this kind of suggests, this conflict anyway, is one in which you might um, invoke both grid marks and feet, and this is the theory that um, Weissman proposes. Um, so you see they're largely orthogonal um, systems, but they do intersect via certain constraints which monitor the assignment of grid marks to positions in feet. Okay, so um, I won't spend too much time on the theory. Um, there are basically five types of constraints. There are some standard grid-based constraints, and there are foot-based constraints, and there are constraints that uh, cover the interaction between the, or the assignment of grid marks to positions within feet. Uh, so you have anti-clash constraints, anti-final <coughs> stress constraints, um, anti-grid mark constraints, which ban grid marks in certain metrically strong positions, and then you have alignment constraints governing the positioning of grid marks relevant, relative to the word and grid marks relative to the feet. So you have to cover both primary stress and secondary stress, of course. Okay, um, so when you introduce this array of constraints, in particular separate alignment constraints for feet and grid marks, then you can have grid marks being pulled to different edge, a different edge from the feet. Okay, so you can have left-oriented feet but right-oriented primary stress in Nganasan. Um, uh, you can get switches between iambic and trochaic feet here. Um, okay, so here you have the default primary stress on the penalt, um, resulting from an iambic rather than a trochaic foot, and this follows from the ranking of a line right, the second tier of grid mark, the higher tier, to the right edge of the word versus um, being ranked above a line, the second tier of second tier grid mark to the left edge of a foot. Okay, okay. Uh, and then there are also constraints, we need a constraint that will ban level two, i.e. primary stress grid marks associated with central vowels above one that monitors the alignment, or governs the alignment of primary uh, grid two stress marks to the foot. Okay, and then you get uh, cases like um, the one here where you have stress on the anti-penalt rather than the penalt, which you would expect looking purely at the foot-based uh, metrical structure. 
All right. Okay, and then you have non-finality, which will um, take, which will actually produce stressless feet here. Uh, in cases like this one here, um, where the par a parse constraint forces it, you parse the final syllable into a foot, but it's not going to be stressed because of non-finality. Okay, so let's um, see if there's any uh, common features shared between top-down prominence and the metrical conflicts. I've uh, drawn this bifurcation between these two types of metrical incoherence, and there are similarities, actually. Chickasaw and Nganasan will turn out to look very similar in a few ways. Uh, one is they have left-oriented secondary stress. Okay. Uh, they also have right-oriented primary stress, and that primary stress is weight-sensitive in a way that's remarkably similar between the two languages, except we'll see that there's um, a difference in how we might uh, refer to what it is uh, that's the uh, basis for prominence in the two languages. Okay, so let's look at Chickasaw here. So this is the language that I have more data on, I've looked at for longer. The basic system is uh, you form IAMs from left to right. Final syllables are also stressed, even if they're light. Okay. Um, the final syllable carries primary stress, uh, unless there's an earlier long vowel, in which case the long vowel attracts primary stress. And if there's two long vowels, um, it's usually the rightmost one, but it could be the leftmost one that attracts primary stress. Okay, there's various segmental diagnostics of stress. One of them is a familiar iambic lengthening one uh, with a strong syllable, a, a strong CV syllable that's non-final lengthened, so chicho kosh komoche, chikisili, where you have iambic lengthening. There's also various lenition or deletion processes that target unstressed vowels, pisatok, um, could be pisatok versus sapisa, where you have the same syllable almost deleted in one case because it's in a weak position of foot uh, and lengthened in the second case, then you have uh, various deletion processes that are foot dependent as well. Okay, so those are the phrase internal cases. Those are the more straightforward cases. Phrase finally, there's a, a more complex stress system. There's a difference between statements and questions. Statements are easy. So statements have stress. I'm going to call it stress now to remain agnostic about what the kind of prominence is. Um, and then I'll talk about what it means to be stressed in a second in Chickasaw. So you get final stress. These are in phrase final words. Um, uh, if you have a word that's in final position of a question, you have weight sensitivity come into play. So you stress a final super heavy syllable. Okay. Um, I have here, so super heavy is a long vowel. Um, there are no lengthened vowels uh, in final position. That should be in the next clause. Otherwise, on a penultimate heavy, so penultimate heavy is either CVV or CVC. Uh, otherwise, on the anti-penult. Okay, and this looks a lot actually like Nanasan, the same stress system, but the types of syllable that count as heavy are a little bit different in the case of the last two components. Okay, there are morphological complications. I only mention these not to be confusing, um, but just because we need that l the second element here, uh, it's going to be relevant uh, in looking at segment segmental diagnostics. Prefixes uh, don't carry primary stress phrase finally, and if there is a suffix syllable, it has to carry uh, primary stress. Um, uh, unless the only one is final, so we'll see why that is in a second. Okay, so what this difference between this system in phrase internal and phrase final words and this further split between phrase final questions, uh, words in phrase final position of questions and words in phrase final position of statements means is that words have different stress patterns, different depending on where they occur. So a word like okchalinchi can be okchalinchi, can be Okchalinchi, it could be okchalinchi, okay, depending on whether it's phrase internal, question final, or statement final. Uh, and the next case is the alligators case, uh, where you can have tsho or tisho, okay, where a syllable is completely stressless, uh, will be uh, promoted to primary stress in question final position. Okay, and 
There are diagnostics, as I said, for metrical structure in Chickasaw, and they all fall into line once we place the stress in the Chickasaw word, which depends on the context in which it occurs. So lengthening, uh, devoicing, so the show that you get phrase internally or at the end of statements becomes tisho with no devoicing. Uh, and then you have the um, uh, iambic vowel lengthening. That clause about suffixes requiring the primary stress comes into play here. So we get pisalitok in questions. So litok is a suffixal string, and once we have the primary accent on li, it has to lengthen, lengthen to, um, uh, because it's primary stress. Same with intrasibyl and coronal deletion, pisachitum, um, not pisashtok. Okay, so chi, now it's saved, that vowel is saved because it's accented. Okay, phonetically there are differences between phrase internal and phrase final stress that are important. Okay, here's uh, just some results uh, from an earlier study on phrase internal stress. So there's a lot of interspeaker variation, but the general pattern is most robustly for stress syllables. Primary stress syllables to have the greatest duration and greatest intensity. Secondary stress syllables to be intermediate between primary and unstressed syllables in, in duration. And then unstressed uh, syllables have the shortest duration and the lowest intensity. F0 is a secondary correlate as well, particularly in distinguishing between unstressed syllables and syllables that have any degree of stress. Okay, that's phrase internal words. What about phrase finally? Well, phrase finally anticipated this probably. It's really F0 that's the relevant property in determining what stress is. It's really a pitch accent. So Chickasaw places a high tone, a high pitch accent on a syllable within the final word of an intonational phrase. Uh, you can see in Malili and Kadimichtan Ishtani where you have a high star in the first word and at the end of a statement, and the second word, it's on the penultimate syllable of a question. So the basic analysis is that a final low boundary, there's a tonal crowding effect here that we just saw, um, talked about, uh, that's repelling the pitch accent in, term, in questions. Uh, only final long vowels can support both a pitch accent and a boundary tone, so they're the only ones that can carry primary stress uh, at the end of questions. Statements, it doesn't matter because there's no final low boundary tone to repel the high pitch accent. Okay. And this, on a lower phonetic level, you can see this tonal crowding effect observed. So the closer the syllable is, the pitch accent syllable is to the right edge of a question, the um, earlier the pitch accent occurs within that syllable. So here's just from three speakers, W1, 2, 3. Uh, CVV can occur accented in either final, penultimate, or antepenultimate position. The dark bar represents the end of the, um, the um, vowel. The, these are plots where the actual pitch accent peak is timed relative to the end. You can see it's far from the end in the case of the final CVV syllables because of the tonal crowding effect. On the right, you have CVC syllables. You um, don't get accented final CVC, of course. Uh, only final CVV can get an accent. So the general effect of tonal crowding is observed both on a more phonological and on a lower phonetic level as well. Okay. So what are the representations we might have for Chickasaw? Um, so you can, there you see our Oak Challenge, our savior. Uh, there you can see that phrase internally. Uh, you have one. Uh, the uh, pen initial syllable, the antipenult, carries the primary stress. Then, depending on where you are or which type of phrase you're at the end of, uh, you have a different phrase level prominence, and that conditions a shift in the word level stress to match the primary stress. So this is a top-down effect. Same thing going on with Tisho. Uh, this can be analyzed using constraints that refer to the alignment of pitch accents relative to the right edge of an intonational phrase. And then you invoke a tonal crowding constraint um, that we just saw uh, discussed earlier, where you can't have multiple tones, where the multiple tones here, are, rather than a bitonal pitch accent, are a single pitch accent and a boundary tone, uh, where the tone-bearing unit 
is only a vocalic mora. Um, so top-down effects under this analysis emerge from a ranking of pitch accent constraints above certain word-level stress constraints referring to primary stress. Okay, um, th this is the analysis you can see here. So uh, we're like hashatam in questions. You can see you get penultimate accent um, uh, because you don't want tonal crowding and you don't want to place a tone on a non-vocalic mora. Okay, clash avoidance. So this is a case where you do get vestiges of a bottom-up stress system, just as you'll see in a second from Nganasan, this happens, we actually saw earlier, where um, the suggestion here is that clash avoidance does come into play um, where you have a light penalt. Uh, in that case, you'll get stress on the heavy anti-penalt, um, just because you don't want stress on a heavy anti-penalt uh, and stress on a light penalt. The assumption here that's tacit is that primary stress follows the pitch accent. Okay. So you have to place stress on heavy syllables. Okay, that's highly ranked. And you have to put stress on the pitch accented syllable. So once you have these two requirements, then clash avoidance can come into play and push um, uh, stress to the anti penalt. That way you avoid stressing a light penalt, um, two consecutive stress syllables. OK, so that's the basic Chickasaw analysis. So can it be extended to Nganasan is a question. So the first thing we need to do, um, well, why might you want to, or why, why might you be tempted to? Well, there are some similarities between the two languages. You get right edge alignment of prominence, so the thing that's called primary stress in Nganasan um, that turned out to be pitch accent in Chickasaw. There's a three-syllable prominence window in both languages. Uh, and the choice of the penalt and anti-penalt in both languages is contingent on bottom-up prominence. By bottom-up, I should have said more neutrally, um, secondary stress. OK, so the first thing we need to establish is, is the Nganasan primary stress, could that plausibly be a pitch accent? That's the goal here. OK, so that's what I'm looking at here. This will be relatively preliminary, these data. Um, there's not that much data analyzed here, so more I can analyze. Um, so we're going to look uh, at the extent to which the Chickasaw analysis could be extended to Nganasan. OK, so basically I'm exploring the hypothesis here that prominence phrase internally differs from prominence phrase finally uh, in Nganasan, just as it does in Chickasaw. OK, so. Um, what I'm working, well, actually, I'll plug this in. You can hear a little what, what I'm working with here initially is a three-minute recording, um, which is actually relatively short, but takes a long time to analyze, uh, especially when, uh, well, you'll hear the recording, or maybe you won't. Let's see what happens. So you can see how difficult it is to work with these data. <laughs> Actually, it, it was, I thought it was going to be soft. I didn't think you'd not be able to hear it at all. We'll try to get one more chance in a second. Oh, there we go. Дянгуртан нилыге на гюр сиаруса. Кула, кахи, на на тамуку. Канкавет сытым кирибам омнан тусу. Тамуку талиптея. It's actually not as bad as it sounds as a uh, buzz, but that's machine noise. It's not from the recording. But it's not great, the recording. But well, uh, it's good enough to do some analysis. Um, so what I did was I adopted a conservative definition of what a phrase is um, based on there being a large disjuncture between words. Uh, so if there was some sort of pause, um, there often were breaths associated with certain um, boundaries, uh, that was assumed to be a phrase boundary. So I basically broke the data into phrase internal and phrase final words uh, by this rough criterion. Okay, um, 
Okay, so the general pattern that emerged is the default terminal contour at the end of these large international boundaries was not unexpectedly a pitch fall. Chickasaw seems to be an outlier cross-linguistically to have a rise at the end of statements and a fall at qu in questions. This was the more typical cross-linguistic pattern you saw. Uh, and there often was a pitch peak somewhere near the right edge. Uh, I'll play this one little bit here. Okay, so um, the data, the amount of data is not sufficiently large to uh, verify all five clauses of the Nganasan stress rule, so I need to look at more data. Uh, but So what I did was I broke syllables into ones that were predicted to be primary stressed versus unstressed. There's not enough data to really look at the distinction between secondary and, and primary stress either. So primary stress versus unstressed according to the uh, standard description of Nganasan. So here you have measurements of uh, F0 intensity and duration um, in two words in two positions, IP final and IP medial. Uh, the data aren't very suggestive of much uh, of a distinction between the uh, unstressed and the primary stressed. Most encouraging is the distinction in fundamental frequency between primary stressed and unstressed syllables, but only in phrase final words. Okay, so that kind of looks like a pitch accent phrase finally. Okay, phrase internally, uh, the data are, are less encouraging, uh, but most promising seems to be duration as a potential correlate of primary stress. But the primary, the duration data don't suggest that the primary stress falls uh, in the positions predicted by the traditional description, but rather is simply word initial. So it looks like phrase internally words uh, vowels have greater duration in initial position. Um, these are longer words, words greater than three syllables where you can disentangle initial position from later positions. Uh, why is it initial position? This will become clearer in a second uh, why I've singled out initial position versus other. So this is initial, anti-penultimate, and penultimate. I took a final position because they're associated with uh, lengthening. Okay. Uh, okay, so the data are suggestive, though they're preliminary, so more data needs to be analyzed, is that you may have something like this distinction between phrase internal and phrase final words, where phrase internally, perhaps stress is word initially, uh, is word initial. Phrase finally, on the other hand, you get the prominence um, following the traditional stress description in terms of a pitch accent phonetically, um, and um, here, following Chickasaw, this would require verification as well. Uh, I've moved the primary stress to match the pitch accent, uh, but this can be verified as well, phonetically, assuming we have different correlates for word level versus phrase level stress. Okay, if the, this analysis is empirically correct, then we can just carry over the Chickasaw accent, uh, Chickasaw analysis largely, to Nganasan, where we have a right alignment of pitch accent, anti-tonal crowding, uh, and the tone bearing unit constraint. And then we need an additional constraint at the bottom, banning pitch accents on central vowels. It might ultimately be reducible to the same factors that push pitch accent uh, leftward uh, in questions, uh, but okay, that's a complication, require more complex analysis. I'll just gloss through this quickly. Um, uh, let's skip that. Um, so just an overview, so in this approach, the constraints referring to level two grid marks now would refer to pitch accents if we adopt this type of reanalysis. Then we need a new story for primary stress, of course, uh, and depending on whether it's initial or not, it would have a different guise. Uh, and then we would now have the standard foot formation constraints, trochee and I, I am, handling the level grid, one grid marks, and then we have alignment constraints of the traditional type that promotes secondary stress to primary stress would handle the level two grid marks. And again, the tacit assumption here that can be verified is that stress moves with the pitch accent in the phrase final words. One other thing that I've glossed over here, the possibility of stressless feet. So um, 
Uh, Weissman assumes that feet may be stressless, and this is, came up earlier. Um, a hypothesis that I'd like to suggest is that a lot of the stressless feet, perhaps all, aren't really stressless, but just difficult to hear as stress because they're in post-accentual position. And I'm actually encouraged by this just based on talking, um, you know, based on what I know about Creek, not the standard literature stuff, but talking with my colleague who um, uh, works on Creek a lot, um, that, that may, there actually may be secondary stresses. So, Okay, just a little on the history. Um, so historically, these systems make a lot of stress. Since both languages have overlaid a new system of primary stress on top of the original left to right binary parse, where primary stress I'm using use loosely to cover both pitch accent and um, stress. So Proto Uralic had a trochaic stress system. You can still see it in Finnic languages and um, Hungarian as well. Uh, there's a family tree. The box languages have um, initial stress, some of them in secondary stress. Um, uh, and you see even uh, initial stress popping up in other guises uh, in languages with weight-sensitive stress. So it looks like consonant gradation in Nganasan is an artifact of the original left to right trochaic parse. Then Nganasan introduced a later weight-sensitive primary stress system, uh, introduced weight sensitivity, which makes sense in light of the introduction of long vowels that weren't present in the proto-language. Uh, and then loan words from Russian might have further undermined the original an uh, initial stress system. Uh, and it's interesting that these vestiges of the trochaic parse are still present in other related languages, uh, as Weizmann talks about. Okay, Chickasaw, similar thing. Chickasaw had a left to right iambic system, in the, or there's a proto uh, left to right iambic system in the proto language, um, which is pervasive throughout the family, um, some more productively synchronically than others. So um, that was just a little in history. Um, so could we extend this type of pitch accent analysis to other weight conflicts? I just talked about one. There are others in the literature. Um, uh, Tubatulal, Wariapano, uh, um, that are prominent in the literature. Um, question is, what do we gain by reanalyzing them? Well, of course, as the empirical issue, we want to be accurate. Um, some of the analyses of these metrical conflicts uh, look pretty good. So um, Ryan Bennett has a nice one for Wariapono, where you, he appeals to elements that are independently supported from other languages. So these data, these metrical conflicts may not look so unappealing uh, once you look at his analysis. Okay, um, others, though, seem less amenable to uh, analysis employing a single metrical representation, which um, Bennett does. Um, in these cases, it looks like the uh, segmental diagnostics for metrical structure are more opaque and irregular, uh, suggesting that they're artifacts of an earlier system, and um, it's not clear that they should warrant the same synchronic treatment as more productive properties. Okay. Okay. So what seems to be impossible, though, in languages are those with um, metrical systems, uh, with parses, um, going from one direction to another. So a lot of languages actually allow bidirectional footing. Um, so you have languages where you have a left alignment and right alignment. So you have a single primary stress on one edge and a binary stress system alternate originating at the other edge. What appears to be unattested are languages in which a parse from one direction overruns the parse from the opposite direction. So these are logically possible. So you don't get languages with trochaic feet starting at the left edge and a single right aligned foot, but you have the parse ignore, from the left ignoring the single foot at the right, which is a logical possibility. So that would give you a language like with stress on the first, third, fourth, fifth in a five syllable word. Um, that doesn't occur, it seems, okay, but it could logically. Okay, so to conclude, so um, most languages have a simple metrical system in that you don't need distinct metrical uh, analyses, so overlapping um, or uh, orthogonal metrical systems. Uh, there are some, though, that they do have uh, distinctions between uh, metrical systems. Some of them are the top-down systems, where you have non-metrical prominence uh, being a pitch accent. Uh, so the suggestion is that we can reanalyze, perhaps, some of the metrical conflicts in terms of similar uh, pitch accent 
properties that uh, are relevant, we know from top-down systems. Okay. So the strongest hypothesis is that there are no word internal metrical conflicts. Okay. It's just said in some languages, the segmental diagnostics don't line up or don't fall into line or go uh, to match the uh, shift in stress that you get depending on phrasal context. Okay. So if we adopt this type of reanalysis, the factorial typology that we wind up is ultimately a factorial typology of pitch accent placement, uh, which would include elements like directionality biases, tonal crowding considerations, and constraints that monitor the relationship between pitch accents and word level stress. Thank you. I've always been uh, a little bit curious about the, whether there's a possibility that pitch accents can land on secondary stress syllables. And one of the observations that raises this question in my mind is that in English anyway, it's perfectly possible to have two pitch accents on a single word, like, where did you finally decide to live? In Massachusetts. Right. Uh, I wonder if those phenomena show up in either of these two languages. Uh, Chickasaw is the one I can, really the one I can speak to um, more confidently, where you only get a single pitch accent in virtually all the cases. The only cases where you can have two result from one being a lexical accent, a morpholexical one, that, so that's different from the, the English cases. So uh, the generalization is that there can only be a single uh, one under really any circumstance, except for the one I mentioned. I wonder if instead of uh, constraint domination, having phrasal constraints dominate lexical constraints, you could have a stradal analysis, mm -hmm. and in that way make sense, um, in particular in Ganasan, of the uh, gradation, which might be sensitive to a word level stress organization and um, w on which uh, phrasal stress is superimposed. I believe this is inescapable for some cases of metrical conflict, in particular, um, dog rib that uh, Alex uh, okay. Jaker, who is here, has I don't know um, anything about just yet, written but... <laughs> a massive dissertation about showing that it actually has both iambic and trochaic uh, uh, footing at different uh, levels within the lexicon. Mm. Yeah, no, that way may well be. I mean, it seems that all these cases of conflicts, there aren't that many, um, but they're uh, more and more emerging, um, that they're all different from each other, so it wouldn't shock me if, um, well, I guess I'll learn more about it later, uh, that you get systems that require this type of stratal analysis, yeah. Hi, Matt. I'm Lisa Hi, Selfie Lisa. from UMass. Um, I think a another question I have about the sort of data that may have to concern um, the distribution of tone uh, in the sentence uh, or in, in the phrase is whether or not it's appropriate even to be using the term pitch accent uh, for uh, these particular tones. I mean, there's a sort of a bias, I think, in the way in which, um, um, you know, in languages that don't have lexical tone, uh, the um, <clears throat> uh, tones that don't appear exactly at the edges and so couldn't be analyzed as edge tones might, you know, be called accents or pitch accents, and with the idea that this may, in fact, involve, I mean, the notion of pitch accent does, uh, often enough in the literature, imply an association with a, an independently established prominence, or at least prominence as, as stress. And the, um, um, what I just wanted to raise was a particular example from, this is from uh, Kisselberth's work on Chimwini. Um, uh, in the earlier stage of this work that he did with Abba Sheikh, um, the, uh, they looked at the distribution of um, of long vowels in phrases in the sentence. And um, the um, discovery is that all long vowels um, um, uh, disappear except if they are in a position within the final word of a phrase mm -hmm. that would be plausibly something assigned like for the Latin stress rule. This is something that I argued in my paper in 86. Well, in subsequent work, um, Kisberth has also shown that there's this other uh, Tone. It's not a tone. Uh, is not a tonal language. The tone appears either in penultimate position, 
that's the sort of default case, or in final position when there's a particular, when a certain, I think it's first and second person on the verb, you know, you'll get the, a high tone appearing finally within the phrase. But the point is that um, the high tone that appears in default on the penult uh, will appear even if you have this, uh, a, a long vowel uh, in the antepenultimate position, you know, mm -hmm. so that, which is evidence for, um, um, let's say some kind of word level uh, uh, stress. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, the, we don't get a coincidence of yeah. this high tone and the, and the appearance of long vowel in the final word in a, in a phrase. And, um, you know, my question is, well, couldn't this high tone, why couldn't we just consider this to be an edge tone, which is at the same time um, submitted to a constraint that's very common in Bantu, which is that a high tone can't, fall off, can't appear on a final syllable, so an instance of non-finality, mm. which is overcome in, the, in this morphological case where you know, the person, yeah. first and second person cause, causes you know, the presence of a high at the end. So, I mean, there are other yeah. potential, you know, in, from the perspective of looking at tone, yeah. from what you find in tone languages, there, other you know, uh, ways in which to talk about these seeming clashes between yeah. distribution of a so-called pitch accent and, and the uh, position of, of, um, of, of um, stress as evidenced by other sorts of uh, yeah. uh, um, phonological or phonetic criteria within the sentence. Yeah, yeah this is a recurring issue that I struggle with. Um, I, I guess, I mean, I, the hope is that there's something to latch on that can distinguish between these two possibilities. So the one you're alluding to is a reference directly to tone rather than a pitch accent, which implies some sort of link to stress. And I was trying to think about what, uh, what you might appeal to. And one idea is that if you can find some word level stress, then you already admitted some reference to stress. So if there is an asymmetry between phrase internal and phrase final prominence, and you can identify word initial, for example, phrase internal prominence, once you have a reference to stress, um, then I, I would sort of imagine that that license, license is an appeal to pitch accents under the assumption that all stress languages have pitch accents of an intonational variety. And the other, the other potential diagnostic I would think might be uh, phonetic correlates other than tone, uh, other than F0. So suppose you have greater intensity and duration uh, also docking on that syllable that has the high tone, that that could be used as a diagnostic. The, uh, the issue, of course, is to what extent are these other properties phonetically parasitic on F0? Mm -hmm. um, and I know intensity, I, I think, yeah. can be. Yeah. So if duration, though, um, also lined up, then perhaps you could uh, use that as an argument for a pitch accent as opposed to a tonal one. But you know, I don't think that's, you know, fail safe. Yeah, okay, thanks. <laughs> Thank you.